Thank you, Emily. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us today uh, to our session uh, where we'll be introducing the Information Literacy Reflection Tool. Um, in a minute, we'll introduce ourselves, uh, but we wanted to start with a land acknowledgement. We are presenting, speaking today from the lands of the Clackamas, the Cowlitz, Kathlamet, Multnomah bands of the Chinook, lands of the Kalapuya, the Malala, and many other tribes who are today represented by the Chinook Nation, the Confederated Tribes, tribes of the Grand Ronde, and the Confederated Tribes, tribes of the Siletz Indians, whose relationship with this land continues to this day. We offer gratitude for the land itself, for those who have stewarded it for generations, and for the opportunity to study, learn, work, and be in community on this land. We also acknowledge that Portland, Oregon has one of the largest urban native populations in the US with over 380 federally recognized tribes represented in the urban Portland metropolitan area. We acknowledge the systemic policies of genocide, relocation, and assimilation that still impact many um, indigenous Native American families today. Finally, we respectfully acknowledge and honor past, present, and future indigenous students and educators of our institutions. And we want to thank um, our colleagues at Portland State University Indigenous um, Nation Studies Program, as well as the Chemeketa Community College for crafting portions of this acknowledgement. Um, as we participate in conversation together today, we encourage you to use the chat and ask questions. And um, we wanted to thank Emily and Anne for helping us monitor the chat and we'll try to be responsive and dialogue there and we encourage you to do so. We've also um, shared a link to a Google document and you're, you're invited to, if you choose, um, submit ideas there or questions there that you'd like us to address. Um, we're gonna leave some time at the end uh, for conversation. So um, to introduce ourselves, and as we um, start speaking today, we're going to just share a little bit of inspiration and insight um, that we've gained while engaging in this project. So my name is Sarah Robertson. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a librarian at Portland Community College. Um, and I'm going to give myself a second here to bring up my notes. Um, so I came to this work uh, as a reflective practitioner. I especially value critical questioning and self-reflection in community with others because it deepens my own learning. Um, and with the emergence and then the publication of the information literacy framework years ago um, came the introduction of threshold concepts and in our discipline, um, a renewed emphasis on metacognition. And at that time, I found myself wanting to bring more opportunities for intentional self-reflection and analysis of one's own learning into my teaching. And when I'm considering metacognition in the context of teaching and learning, I think about metacognition as an engine of sorts that drives productive self-reflection. And when I say productive, I'm thinking about self-reflection that asks learners to identify them, the knowledge, the skills, that they're bringing to their own learning and also consider their lived experiences as valuable assets that they bring to their learning. Um, and and self-reflection also offers the opportunity to bring in counter stories and encourage that critical questioning that, that I know many of us really value. Um, so if I was to ask for um, reflection on information literacy in my teaching, I needed to do so with transparency. Um, and so I was really looking for a full description of what we're talking about when we talk about information literacy. Um, and I think that's one of the things I've really gained from as a result of working um, closely with threshold concepts in this project. I also really wanted a reliable tool and, um, and a shout out to my colleagues at Portland Community College because we had been working on some homegrown tools that were really great for self-reflection, um, but they hadn't really been tested for reliability and validity with our populations. So I'm uh, including this slide um, in order to um, 
in order to bring in Carol's work, um, Carol really uh, wants us to consider our own critical reflection on um, on threshold concepts as a tool for professional development. And I think um, they do a really good job of bringing in um, the theorists that really informed my theoretical foundation as I approached this work. So I thought it was worth sharing it with everyone. And now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Michelle. Hi there. Uh, I'm Michelle Burke. I'm a reference instruction librarian at Chemeketa Community College. Um, I was drawn to this project because of the people involved with it. There was a group of people I was just really interested in working with. Um, and I hadn't had an opportunity to work with Sarah before, so that was exciting. Uh, I had been introduced to threshold concepts um, as part of work that Amy Hofer was doing, and that was really excited, exciting, exciting to me. I wanted to learn more about that. Um, we think about making this kind of um, invitation into the discipline for students as a teaching and learning tool. But I also think about that transparency and complexity in relation to advocacy. So um, we don't do ourselves a service by oversimplifying our work. Uh, we want to help stakeholders, our administrators, our public um, communities understand some of that complexity, but in a way that invites them into that. And so by doing that at the undergrad level, we're really <clears throat> reinforcing those moments of interaction all along the IL continuum, which starts even before grade school and goes, you know, all the way through the, the lifespan. So we're helping our K-12 partners um, backward plan and kind of bring the community along with us in understanding what we're trying to do so that the our work is um, understood outside of just resources, that we're more than our collections. We are also this, uh, we provide this vital instructional piece. And my name is Reed Mueller and I'm a psychology professor and um, I want to share quickly just one inspiration and and uh, one insight that that I've gained uh, being part of this team. Uh, with regard to inspiration, uh, in 2017 when I entered the project, we were uh, I was working with a graduate student on uh, their thesis, uh, looking at scientific literacy development in grade schoolers. Uh, and so that concept of scientific literacy uh, became one that I was really fascinated by, given the wash of information we have. Uh, in the popular press and academic journals with regard to scientific information that, that we need to consume and, and really understand. And in 2017, when this opportunity came along, uh, it broadened my perspectives and I started to wonder what the, the uh, relationship between uh, information literacy in general and scientific literacy specifically might be. Um, and so um, that I jumped at, the chance to, to work with this group, uh, which leads me to the insight that I wanted to share. Um, we can uh, be in our silos, our academic discipline silos, and this project has been a, a real joy for me to be part of, uh, to learn from uh, my colleagues on this team uh, who are not psychologists. And um, uh, that, that has led, I hope, to some good in the world through the development of this tool uh, and some good ideas for generating research down the road. So uh, really glad to be here. Look forward to our time together. Hi, um, I'm Kim Olson Charles, um, she, her, um, and I am at University of Western States, head of library public services reference instruction. Um, for me, um, I was really intrigued and curious about the idea of being able to blend aspects of my previous career working in behavioral research um, with librarianship. Um, I'd spent over 20 years administering hundreds of not thousands of questionnaires to research, research participants in longitudinal studies. So I was going out to their, um, year, to their homes year after year, um, and they would often tell me how much they valued their participation because by filling out the same questionnaires annually, be it on parenting or um, eating habits, it gave them a chance to reflect year over year on those practices. And so, um, and they really saw value in that. Um, so I knew right away after talking with Sarah about the Mila project 
that developing a tool that was intentionally metacognitive could be really powerful for students as well. So, um, and the other part was I was really excited to conduct research with students in a higher ed setting and to give those students the opportunity to participate in a meaningful way um, in the creation of the ILRT through their feedback and data. It doesn't happen very often where students get that chance um, to be a part of something like that. Um, so as Sarah mentioned, the framework was relatively new at the point we began, and this project provided the opportunity to take a deep dive into the threshold concepts. And so as you'll hear in the coming slides, we spent the better part of two years breaking the statements down literally word by word while eating a lot of chocolate, um, and then rebuilding them into the statements that would become the ILRT. So the next segment is about the development of um, the ILRT with Reed and Sarah, and I will be sharing more about that. I'm just pausing for a sec here to see if there are any questions. Looks like chat's been kind of quiet, so we can move on. So um, the development of the ILRT was a multi-year, multi-step project, and it was really a community effort. Um, as you can see from the timeline on the slide, without our community of librarians and course instructors, PCC students, including the students who were the study participants, and the ones that helped us with um, our design of our print version, um, we had copyright experts, and not to mention our countless colleagues um, who listened to us and provided feedback from our respective institutions, we wouldn't be here today talking to you. So we'd like to give a special um, thanks to Alago for providing a platform and ongoing support over the last three plus years. So just briefly, um, in 2017, the MILA, the Metacognitive um, Information Literacy Assessment um, Project, which was the original name that some of you may recognize, um, was introduced at the IL Summit with the review um, of the literature. Um, this was the first time our colleagues um, were able to provide feedback through a brainstorming session. Um, in 2018, we sought out expert reviewers. And so we're, we're so appreciative of the nine folks um, who agreed. Um, and we'll have more about that in the um, methodology section that we'll be talking about. 2019 through 2021, PCC students and faculty played a big role. Um, they allowed us into their classrooms, um, providing data and helping us with our hard copy design. So at each of these points, we, we gathered qualitative and quantitative data. Um, except for when we were working with the design students, there was no data collected there. Um, using a mixed method research design, which Reed's going to go into more detail on. Yeah, so this this community effort um, really was wrapped in a mixed method uh, methodology, and as you can see, we've we've changed the slides a little bit here. Uh, we really, when we were articulating the design, we really were looking at trying to have a balanced qualitative quantitative design so that at most steps along the way, and you can see uh, at each of those phases, uh, we obtained both qualitative and quantitative data um, and analyzed them both separately and together uh, as, we move, as we move forward in the phases. Um, the objective of all this work over these years has been to develop a useful, valid, and reliable tool. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the specifics of uh, why you can trust this tool, why, why it's useful, um, in that it is valid and reliable uh, in the slides to come. And uh, I should note also at each one of these phases, we obtained uh, appropriate IRB uh, approvals uh, before moving on and uh, starting this work. And Sarah's gonna launch off with uh, where that work really started. So like a lot of um, my most creative thinking, <laughs> it begins in conversations at my kitchen table. And um, maybe you can relate. Um, so I wrote the initial set of statements in conversation with Sean Dennison's work um, and, there, and a study that we cite from 1994 where they established some metacogn metacognitive constructs. And these constructs define different types of metacognition. So that includes the regulation of cognition. So that, that's like um, cognitive moves such as planning or monitoring or debugging or evaluation of one's own learning and also knowledge of cognition. So this is awareness of one's own skills or intellectual resources and knowledge of how and when to use learning strategies in the process of learning. 
And this is um, just a little insight into the process. So uh, we broke down all of the knowledge practices and dispositions across the framework. So it, our coding on the left-hand column D2, that's uh, for, um, for the second listed uh, frame in, in, the, in the framework. And then um, D2.1 is just the first disposition li um, listed. And then you'll see um, statements that, that we drafted. And also on the right-hand column, our coding for the type of metacognition that that initial draft statement represents. Um, I should also mention that um, the initial set of statements were really meant to cover the breadth um, and all of the key concepts in um, the ACRL framework. Okay. And a little bit of a terminology, terminology check here. Um, we will sometimes use construct or domain to describe a threshold concept. Um, and taken together, this reflection, the reflection scale that we've developed measures each of the threshold concepts defined by the IL framework. So just a little bit of terminology to keep us on track there. Oh, I'm gonna forward the slide. Let's see. There we go. Oh, Kim, you're muted. Can you go back one slide to phase one? Sure, you bet. Thanks. All right, so phase one, the expert review, which was um, checking content validity. So um, in order to assure that the statements were covering all the aspects of the construct, um, we reached out to some of our librarian and writing instructor colleagues to provide us some of um, their expert review. They were asked to review and rate 101 statements, the statements that Sarah had created, um, to determine the statement's fit, the strength of the relationship to the main idea of the threshold, by using a Likert scale, which was our quantitative data. Participants were also able to provide written feedback, the qualitative data, um, which was coded, um, this information helped us to determine um, revisions and deletions of unfit items. So the research team's decisions about each draft statement was driven by the qualitative and quantitative expert feedback, where the qualitative and quantitative, that's a lot of qualitative quantitative, um, results aligned and suggested the same action to be taken on an item. The item was either um, retained, revised, moved to a different um, framework domain, or removed um, depending on the alignment. In total, only seven items were removed. The remaining 94, many with revised language, which inc were included in the pilot measure um, to test with students in phase two. So this is really where I was, I was saying we broke it down word by word. This is where we were doing that. Um, and then revising um, and creating our next, our next set. Do you want to slide? Sarah, could you go to the next slide? Mm -hmm. I'm working on Thanks. It. There we go. So then in phase two um, was our student um, pilot uh, gathering student feedback, which was our face validity check. So in the summer of 2019, in order to confirm that the remaining items resonated with our intended um, user group, we conducted a pilot study with PCC students. So a total of 44 students consented to participate and were from either one of two Writing 122 courses or a student success course. The students um, piloted the remaining 94 statements that made it through from that first phase. As part of the instructions, um, they were asked um, to provide written feedback on statements that, um, that were unclear or didn't make sense to them as they were working their way through the written um, paper form of the IRRT. So once they'd completed that, they were also, as a group, asked to provide verbal feedback. And that feedback was documented by Michelle and Sarah and I and later reviewed. So where concerns were raised either by an individual or the classroom as a whole, the item was either revised and retained um, or removed from the, the item pool. So altogether, 24 items were removed based upon the feedback by those participants. And that resulted in a 72 item scale for the use of the onset of phase three. And so if you're more interested in the demographic background and all of that, that those details um, are available in our user manual. And so then Reed's gonna go on to talk about uh, phase three. Yes, uh, forgot I was muted there for a second. 
Um, yeah, phase three was really uh, where we obtained quite a lot of quantitative data to help um, bring in some objective indicators of whether we had achieved our goal uh, or establish some evidence toward our goal of developing a useful, uh, valid, and reliable tool. Uh, and so I want to take you, walk you through uh, three steps within phase three that hopefully will help you get a sense of that. Um, I'd like to start by contextualizing it with an object we're all too familiar with, or at least many of us are, the bathroom scale. Um, for the bathroom scale to be useful, it shouldn't be too unwieldy, it should store very nicely, uh, it shouldn't take a lot of time to set up or use, you should just get right on it and get the feedback that you um, are looking for. Uh, but that's only one aspect of usefulness, uh, another aspect is validity. If I stepped on my bathroom scale, uh, and every morning I stepped on, uh, the readout was 98.6. I might suspect that it wasn't measuring my weight, but rather something else. And so validity has to do with whether an instrument is measuring what it purports to measure. So that's where we started in phase three. And the first portion of that, 3.1, was working on usability and validity, uh, construct validity specifically. With usability, we wanted to use statistical methods to further refine the total number of items we needed to measure um, information literacy in these various uh, domains well. And so we recruited uh, 542 community college students across 16 Writing 121 uh, courses. You'll note here, and I'll refer back to, to Kim's statement, that the full demographic details are in the user manual. Uh, a user guide, I should say, but here I've reported the mean and age with standard deviation, as well as the modes for other um, demographic indicators. Uh, so we used a four-step process for item reduction uh, that's well established in the literature by Appleton and colleagues and Martian colleagues. And then subsequent to uh, reducing the number of items statistically, uh, we moved on to establishing construct validity or seeking to establish construct validity through exploratory structural equation modeling or ESAM and confirmatory factor analysis or CFA. And I'll talk about the results of this subphase on the next slide. This is where you all can get a drink, unglaze your eyes and I'll dive right back in. All right, so one slide previous to that, please, Sarah. Thank you. So with regard to item reduction, um, that four-step process uh, reduced the number of items further from 72 to 57, which is our final item pool. Um, the good news there is that each of the uh, item groups that would point to one of the threshold concepts or constructs uh, demonstrated strong internal uh, consistency through Kronbach alpha coefficients uh, within the ranges you can see uh, on the slide there. That's just a really strong indicator that those, in, those items are measuring the same thing pointing in the same direction within a subscale. So that gave us confidence to look forward to assessing different possible models to explain how we were measuring uh, information literacy well, given the frames we were trying to, me to measure. Um, so we looked at four competing models. The first model uh, was an ICM CFA uh, and the fourth model, I, I, I'm skipping around for a reason here, is an exploratory uh, structural equation model or ESEM model. Those are the two that our hunches uh, were, were aimed at. We felt like those two possibilities were very similar and really reflected how we intended to design the instrument or the tool to be used. The other two were added, the HCFA and the BCFA, were added uh, intentionally as competing measures as suggested in the literature. Uh, the good news comes on the next slide. And that good news is that all four of those models suggested that the, the tool was working as intended. That is, it measures um, information literacy across these domains uh, together and individually within those threshold concepts. Even better news is that the model we, we set out to use and design when we tested it statistically, the ESEM model, it had the best fit against all other models. Um, if you're not familiar with uh, these kinds of indicators, what you can see across the top row, uh, indicating column heads, those are uh, measures of fit for a model against observed data. Uh, and the good news on this whole table is that every single model um, ex exceeds those uh, thresholds that are known in the literature for a good fit, a well-fitting model, I should say. Uh, and even better, one model emerged in competing with the others as the best fit, and that's the ESAM. 
So that was phase one, looking at validity. So at that point, as we move to the next slide, you're, you're interested in two other things about usability with your bathroom scale. I'll go back to that. You want it to be easy to use, right? Uh, you not only that want that, but you want it to measure weight and not something else. But you also want it to be reliable. And there's two ways your bathroom scale can be reliable. The first one is the one related to uh, this slide. Uh, imagine stepping onto your bathroom scale this morning at 6.57 a.m. You step off and you step right back on. You would expect that scale, if it's reliable, to on the first test give you one number and on the retest, that seconds later retest, to give you the exact same figure for, for what the weight is. That's what we were hoping to accomplish or to see if we could, we could show in this uh, second subphase of uh, phase three. Uh, so uh, we recruited 77 community college students, not in writing courses, because you might expect some change uh, in their information literacy very rapidly, perhaps, in a, in a writing course, but in a college success course. Um, so 77 community college students in those types of courses consented to participate in the research. Uh, and they were tested at two times with a relatively short interval between those times of about two weeks. Um, it's common in the literature to assess test retest validity with such a tool uh, using intra-class correlations. So that's what we did. Uh, and the next slide again brings us some good supportive news that when we don't expect to see change, um, when, we, when we would be surprised if there were significant change, uh, we just don't see either of, we just don't see that. Uh, so it's like the scale. You take, you step on it at one minute, you step on the next minute, gives you the same weight. This tool, if you take it at, at week two in a college uh, readiness course and week three or four in a college readiness course, the scores are very similar. Um, overall, the results suggest that uh, we have moderate to good test retest stability across all the subscales and uh, very strong test retest uh, reliability for the whole ILRT. And then transitioning to my last couple of slides, there's another type of reliability that you want in a bathroom scale. So when I step on my bathroom scale on November 1st, and then I step on it again January 2nd of the following year, uh, I want it to reliably detect the change that I can see in my own self. Uh, you can imagine what change that might be and why that might occur. <laughs> Um, but if it didn't register any change, if it wasn't sensitive that, to that change, I would, I would like the scale, the bathroom scale, but I wouldn't trust it. Um, and so uh, in this regard, we wanted it to be one more thing in phase three, uh, and that is to see if, if the ILRT can detect change when we expect change to occur. Uh, and so we recruited 167 community college students, all of these in writing 121 courses, uh, and uh, we, we had them self-reflect uh, using the ILRT uh, at week two or three in this writing, in their writing course. And then again, in the last two to uh, three weeks of that course, We'd, we would expect some growth in various domains uh, of these threshold concepts. Um, the way we measured uh, or tried to detect whether there, there was change being picked up was by using paired samples t-tests of these 167 participants. Uh, and we've uh, calculated effect sizes uh, for a reason I'll talk about in this next slide. Again, there's some pretty good news on this next slide. In every case, uh, whether it be the total ILRT score or the sub score or the subdomains, the constructs, uh, the subscales, I should say, change was detected and change uh, moved in the expected direction in each and every case. Uh, this occurred for both large effects, so where students on average in a class grew a lot with regard to their uh, preponderance of use of these skills and dispositions, uh, as well as when very little change occurred, we were still able to pick that up. So uh, like a bathroom scale, it can pick up a gain of five pounds, it can pick up a gain of a half pound, that's a good bathroom scale. Uh, this scale can pick up small changes as well as larger changes across time when expected changes would occur. So uh, again, as we set out on this whole project, we wanted to develop a useful, valid, and reliable tool. Those are all interconnected and relate. Uh, and we hope to offer that to the community uh, for use at this point. Uh, there are some limitations in any research, and I'll hand that off to, to, to Sarah. 
Hi everyone. Um, so um, as researchers and educators, our goal throughout this process, um, as we've gone about um, analyzing data and making decisions around our research design, um, throughout that process, our goal has been to design a tool that positions folks as experts on their own learning experience, as well as a tool that fosters an asset-based um, classroom culture and a tool that calls for the social dimensions of learning to surface, be visible, and have import. And in service of that goal, it's important to acknowledge that we are a pr pretty homogenous group of researchers. Um, we identify as white, middle-aged, mid-career, fully employed, and three of the four of us identify as cisgender females and, and academic librarians. Um, we've been challenged to work through what Milner calls the potential dangers seen, unseen, and unforeseen throughout our process and to reconsider our own racialized and cultural positionality while conducting this research. We, we've likely had some blind spots and um, that have impeded our intentions for this tool. So we wanted to recognize that and we also really believe that how this tool is implemented in the context of learning will greatly impact how it's perceived and how it's used. And we're entrusting all of you, our community of practitioners, to carry it forward with critical awareness. And with that, we will um, talk about accessing the tool um, and using the tool. I'm pausing just for a second here to see if there's any um, questions. Okay, I'm not seeing any pop up. We encourage dialogue. So, um, we, the next few slides, I'm going to go over how to start using it, um, but just know that everything's available on our website and we really would love to hear from you. There, on our website is a, a short Google form that allows you to sign up for our, what we're calling our mailing list, and that's just as we have new developments, um, we can communicate with you and hear from you. Okay, so scales like ours, when formatted, can easily look like a test, right? We wanted to get as far away from that Scantron look as possible because that's really not the intention for our tool. Um, so having established the scale, we next recognized this as truly a design problem at its heart. And so we reached out to some graphic design students, well, a graphic design instructor at PCC, worked with um, a class of students and selected this one out of many. Um, so when looking at the PDF designed version um, that we offer up on our website, you'll notice that the statements aren't exactly linear on the page. So a reader is really invited to jump around. There's also space for note taking at the bottom and instructions live at the top of the page there so that each page can stand alone. Um, the PDF or web version of the tool we think is really handy to use while teaching if you want to just refer back to the concepts and strategies covered there. Um, we also encourage you to share the PDF version with students and we really think a printed copy of the tool can make it easier for students to reflect and take notes. Um, we also currently have a typo in the attribution copyright statement that should be fixed this week, but we wanted to call that out um, and let you know that we are aware of it. Oh, and a shout out to Sari Field, our um, chosen designer there. Go check out Sari's work. Okay, calculating scores. So um, when looking at the ILRT, um, you'll notice it's arranged in six sections or sets and the number of statements or items in each set varies. So scores can be calculated by adding together the value chosen for each item and then dividing by the total number of items um, in that set in order to reach an average score for the section. So I'm gonna mix my jargon up a little bit here um, and use some psychometric language just for clarification. So the entire tool, all six sections, is a scale. Each section is a subscale that measures the dispositions and practices that make up a domain, sometimes called a construct. The domains that make up the ILRT have been tested to measure each of the six threshold concepts in the IL framework. So um, hopefully, Hopefully that um, aids for understanding. <laughs> okay, so when interpreting scores, what do they mean? 
Um, the score provides an average for each um, subscale of the frame. And I encourage you to consider interpreting scores really as an activity that sparks, that's meant to spark discussion about how we perceive ourselves as, as learners. On the right hand side there, you'll see this is um, language we currently use in the Google Sheet version of our, of our tool. And this is automatically generated feedback. Um, it's really about how a user reports um, their, how often or frequently and how much um, a given strategy reflects how much they're using that strategy or skill or concept. Um, so questions that they might ask themselves are questions like, what might be a familiar idea um, that represented in the tool, but one that I have yet to put into practice? What approaches are working for my learning? Um, that, that kind of reflective di dialogue could be um, really productive for myself as a learner. And it can be even more meaningful um, in the in community with others. Um, so when looking at scores with students, you can also help them set the expectation that self rating may change over time, right, and also over context. Okay, I'm next going to run through um, the different versions of the tool that are available on our website. So we have a Google form version, it, um, and it automatically um, collects emails and can the settings are set up so that it can send responses to individual users. Um, you might also, um, when working with a group, uh, it can be good for looking at patterns of responses at the, at the statement level. Um, but at this time, it's not set up that um, average subscale scores are calculated. So that's not available in the Google Form version yet. Okay, we also have a Google document version um, that's available for download and also when you're viewing it in Google, um, uh, viewing it online as a Google document, you can download it in other formats like um, rich text or text format if that's um, useful for you. Um, and once you copy it, uh, it, will be, it will live in your Google Drive, so that's where you want to go to find it. So this is the Google Sheets version, and um, this one um, does generate a score at the subscale level, and um, will give automatic responses uh, to the when it's completed. And you just it, it basically is set up so that an individual can just put in, type in their responses um, for each item. Okay. All of this is available in our user guide, um, and it has guidance for scoring as well as more details on our technical report. Um, and we're going to main be maintaining this, so um, as we have updates, uh, they'll be reflected there. And I'm going to pass it now over to Michelle, who's going to be talking about some more specifics around ideas for using the tool. and um, and it, and I'm looking over at the chat and we don't have a lot of comments there, so I think we can move move forward. Okay. Um, just a reminder, since we're going to start talking about potential ways to use this, that if ideas, you know, things are popping up and you want to capture them, there is a link to that shared document and you could um, contribute your ideas there. We'll take a look at them. Um, Thanks, Anne. Anne's posting the link in the chat. Um, I also just want to reference the user manual that Sarah mentioned, so or user guide. Uh, I, I'm very attached to that technical piece of writing now. I kind of love it. And the more time that I've spent with it, I think it would be really interesting to use that in instruction. So if you were maybe working with, say, a psychology class and you wanted to use this instrument you know, to um, help uh, integrate some information literacy concepts. You could also use that guide to surface the, the um, cross-disciplinary collaboration, maybe the blending of that psychometric lingo with the information literacy lingo. So there's some potential there. Um, here are just a few general kind of heads up. And this uh, is going to be the second meeting today where I'm, you know, remember the motto, do no harm. So, um, we, we've said, you know, you can obviously administer this instrument all at one time. That's great. 
you can administer the sections and they will stand alone and that's great. But as far as taking questions from each section and sort of putting them into a new assessment and giving that assessment to your students, um, that type of cherry picking, just be aware that it would um, harm the validity, uh, the tested validity that was established of the instrument. So if that kind of validity is important to you, you wouldn't want to cherry pick statements like that. And you also wouldn't want to combine sections. So you could generate an average score on a section and generate an average score on another section, but you wouldn't want to take like say three sections and total the scores and do an average that way. And we have some more granular detail about that in the user manual. Um, it's validated with those undergrad novice researchers. I could see this being useful in K-12 situations and we've already had um, people reach out to us about that. But again, just that heads up that it's not the population that it was um, tested with. And so we'll just have to kind of think about how to use that moving forward. And when we share this with colleagues at PCC and you know, along the stages of development, um, they cautioned us just about creating an instrument where we are presenting concepts that are new to a group of students and then unintentionally making them feel like they are deficient by giving a score um, without the context and you know, making it seem as if it's, um, as if somehow they're not sort of meeting up or, or uh, performing where they should be. And that's just not how this is intended. This is really a tool to use in teaching and learning situations and scores don't reflect grades. Um, so thinking about ways to use this, I, I think I'm preaching to the choir, but I'm just going to highlight a few ideas and then we can, we can have discussion. So on the cover sheet of the PDF version, um, this part that's circled in red lists a few ideas and that voice is sort of directed to the student. So it's almost like saying that you came across this on your own and you were like, hey, how do I use this? Here are some ideas. They have to do with um, personal reflection and conversation, sort of looking at the scores or the statements and digging into what those mean. Um, we're very interested in the way that this tool makes transparent the ways of thinking, our habits and dispositions that we care about when we're working with information literacy. And so it could hopefully be um, useful in um, transparent design and uh, that invitation to new learners or people outside the discipline. Um, we can track changes over time. We talked about that uh, type of um, the, the scale, right? The November to January, seeing how it changes. So that could be helpful for students, sort of um, giving them that moment to reflect on how they've grown or changed personally. And it could also be helpful for instructors um, to just kind of see how significant were the instructional interventions that they had. So, you know, that assignment, that activity, that discussion, uh, how much did that impact the way the students perceived their own um, development in that area? We're reinforcing metacognition across the the curriculum by using this and articulating it as a value that is shared. It's a common value of higher ed. Um, and that emerges really specifically in a couple of disciplines that make it explicit. And um, we'll look at two of those in a minute. And then it's a nice way to just do um, sort of a check-in, get yourself in the right frame of mind and maybe get ideas if you're stuck. Um, there are some of the statements kind of prompt like, you know, oh, I could ask a librarian or maybe I could use one source to find another source. Um, or just that, you know, am I, am I looking for multiple perspectives during this project? Uh, so we're, we're thinking it might be useful. I, I love this image of the student. Well, of course I have mine right here where you just, you know, pull up your trusty copy and um, everything's okay. So. Um, so I think let's move to the sec this next slide. Um, I wanted to dig into one example of the way that this could surface and maybe interesting 
you know, interestingly complicate, complicate in interesting ways, a concept that's shared. So um, on the right is a cover sheet that Sarah made that I'm gaga over. I love this. Um, it has an introduction to threshold concepts generally at the top. And so that's one way that this reflection tool could be used in service across the curriculum is a way to just start introducing threshold concepts exist. And that adds transparency to the whole sort of educational endeavor when students realize, okay, this is part of what's going on here. Like I'm learning how to think within a discipline and there are these concepts involved, you know, that, so anyway, we think that that would be helpful. This has a, what I consider to be a really nice, elegant definition at the top. And then it's broken out with two examples. Um, one on the side would maybe be something people have encountered in possibly in, in their, their life if they've learned to ride a bicycle. So the threshold concept there is balance and it describes that. And then the other one pulls out an example of a threshold concept from writing or composition. And in this case, it's audience. Um, so that attention to audience, there's an opportunity for us to help our colleagues in writing classes um, emphasize something that's really important in their discipline by, you know, sometimes it's just helpful for, for students to hear somebody else say the same thing. Yes, we care about that. Um, and then we can make it more complex by looking at it through this lens of information literacy. So I plucked a statement, that's what's over on the left here. When creating information to share, I consider what evidence is most valued by my audience. So at a really basic level, it's like, yeah, let's think about our audience. The audience exists and what kind of, of evidence do they value? Um, if you're sort of stepping back and looking broadly at higher ed, okay, what kind of evidence is valued by the discipline that I'm interested in or the class that I'm in? So I'm in my psychology class, I'm in a biology class. What kind of evidence is valued in that situation? Um, and, and how is that communicated? Where is it communicated? Okay. And then interesting, I, I think they're interesting ethical questions that you could surface. Um, so if you are choosing evidence based on what is most valued by your audience, what if your audience has particularly low standards? Um, or, you know, can you think of a situation where an audience, a group of people intentionally groom an audience to trust or mistrust types of information. Um, we see a little bit of that happening right now, maybe, maybe not intentionally, but maybe around um, vaccines or uh, trusting science or, you know, so I think that there are some um, opportunities there to dig into it. And with multimodal communication embedded in writing 122 and composition, I think particularly there, you could also look at communication because we have a threshold, we, we have a statement within this idea of um, connecting with audience about choosing, being intentional about choosing a communication method. And if you think about that with evidence and audience, um, and a multimodal object in something like advertising. If, you're, if your audience were children, the way that you perhaps surface evidence, I'm reflect, maybe some of us are old enough to remember the um, Joe Camel ad campaign where uh, Camel Cigarettes uses a, a mascot of a cartoon type camel to represent um, their product, cigarettes. What, how is evidence being prioritized there? Um, what are we not talking about as opposed to how are we really communicating with the audience about the fun, you know, kind of, um, uh, we're, we're not, we're, we're maybe not prioritizing health in that situation. That's where I'm headed with that example. Um, okay, so that's just some ways that you might use use that in, would we look at the next slide and I'll break it out a tiny bit more. We're just, um, so this is a cluster of a few statements at the top that connect with FYE first year experience classes. And then at the bottom with composition classes, both of these areas um, are explicit about including metacognition and reflection in their outcomes. So that's helpful right there. 
what I like about the top uh, statements is it's using the ILRT to help identify places where we share values with that, um, with those instructors and those outcomes that don't necessarily involve research. So even though there isn't, in, at least at Chemeketa, a strict research component, this outcome about, I ask librarians, instructors, professionals for help when I need guidance, that is something that they're trying to incorporate in FYE all the time is how to build um, an academic support network. So it might surface ideas where you could collaborate um, in the absence of an obvious, like I need to find a journal article type of a catalyst for that. Um, the, the example below around composition I included because it, it might demonstrate leveling I'm working with a 115 class that's going to use this tool. And this is one of the things that we're looking at is this idea of summarizing between two different sources. And so again, not a heavy duty research component, but we have this shared value of wanting to be able to connect ideas um, from two different sources in an elegant way. Okay, and one more slide from me, and then I think we can have some. I just wanted to make a nod um, to using the reflection tool in institutional conversation. So at Chemeketa, maybe at your library or your um, college or university, we're looking at the 2020 accreditation standards, and 1.6.6 calls out the need to set and commit to institutional learning outcomes. Um, they list at the bottom of that information literacy as one possibility. I think this tool can be helpful. You know, the framework, as much as we, we might uh, love or appreciate the ACRL framework, it, it does hit or register as kind of complicated. I think this makes a nice balance of like, sure, you know, there's the framework, but look at this reflection tool as a way to get a picture of what it could look like in an undergrad, um, you know, across the curriculum program there in an accessible way. And just my only other heads up, you know, this is really important to us because the only other place that libraries are mentioned in the accreditation standards is in um, a separate section. And it's just related to um, employing the adequate number of personnel to basically keep your facilities. And it, it, there's sort of a focus on resources and facilities. It doesn't mention instruction. So few ideas, and I'm going to look at the chat, but I think we might be ready for discussion, questions and answers or. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. Mm -hmm. um, there have been a few chats that have come through. Um, and I took a peek at the, our shared document and um, I don't see any questions there. So I think maybe we could uh, invite folks if they have a question that they'd like to, um, you know, turn on unmute and, uh, and ask it or use the chat either would be, would be fine. I just, I just want to point out, I noticed Melissa is like, this is what I prefaced my first use of this tool with. I'm like, she's already using it. I haven't even used it yet. <laughs> um, please feel free to turn on your microphones if you want to use your mic. Whoops, I can jump in here if you want. <laughs> Um, since I asked the question about your intentions, building in an intention um, as a way of something to reflect upon, because oftentimes we're asked to reflect upon something in which what happened to you, um, having a basis for, I would like to do this, I would like to do something else, I would like to learn this prior to actually experiencing something builds a much stronger and deeper reflection. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we often, you know, in your teaching, you, you go into a class to teach and you have your learning objectives, if you will, or other intentions in terms of your self-practice. I don't want to say um so much in my session or, you know, I don't want to look at the blackboard when I'm teaching and speaking to students. Okay, so those are the intentions. After you finish it, 
um, having those as a basis for something to reflect upon provide a deeper reflection. It often can be something you work on, but it also, as you're experiencing something, oftentimes something new and different happens and you go, you, you change your intention to something different, which is what Stephen Brookfield would call a critical incident. Okay, and that critical incident becomes almost a textbook of the reflection. You, you, why did you, why did you change what you were thinking you were going to do? Or why did you have that aha moment that was so different than anything you expected to happen today? And that's a really strong place to begin a reflection. So that's kind of what I was talking about in that question. I don't know if I made it worse or better <laughs> the more I talk. <laughs> I like the idea of critical incident. Oh, Brookfield's great about the, that particular kind of thing. I, I've, you know, I, I read Stephen Brookfield for years before I got to see him at the Lilly Conference, and his his work and his web pages about his work are really really fantastic in terms of, although he, you know he's been doing this since 1995, um, and he's much older at this point, um, but his work is really, really good. And the idea that, you know, when, when we teach classes, the critical incident is usually, students don't seem to be getting this. I wonder why that is. I, you know, prepped this so well and everything was gonna work perfectly, but it's not. So I'm gonna pivot and do something different. Sometimes we do those pivots a little too prematurely you know, so it's, uh, you know, maybe we shouldn't have pivoted at that point and it took us off our game um, or what we were really intending and it took us too far away. Other times it, you know, it's something, well, I did this because this was not working and so I tried a different example. Yeah, great idea. So setting intentions and reflecting back on learning experiences and having, um, uh, aspects of this tool be kind of a grounding uh, conversation for that. Um, other ideas or comments? Well, thank you all for your time and attention. Um, looking at our hosts, um, I. I want to thank ACRL Oregon for um, hosting this time and opportunity. Um, so thank you. You're welcome. I wanted to put in the chat a link to the evaluation form. You'll also get it via email. Thank you so much for being here. This was fascinating. I really wish we could have another hour for discussion. <laughs> um, the evaluation form is in the chat. Um, ACRL Oregon is so pleased to, to host all of these great webinars for you. Um, and again, we're recruiting for the ACL Oregon board. So if you'd like to nominate yourself, please be in touch. Thank you for coming. <laughs>